The first item of business is a statement by Fergus Ewing on the future of Scottish agricultural support post-Brexit transitional arrangements. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and so there should be no interventions or interruptions. And I call on Fergus Ewing for up to 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland did not vote for Brexit, but we now have to deal with its consequences. The Scottish Government's preferred option is for the whole of the UK to remain in the EU. Failing that, our consistent position has been that staying in the European single market and the customs union is essential for Scotland's economy and particularly our rural economy. That would enable us to continue to benefit from the four freedoms, freedom of movement of goods, services, people and capital, and also from a wide range of environmental, animal, plant and food standards. But it would mean we're outside the common agricultural policy. In recent months, a wide range of stakeholders have promoted the prospect of change. No change is not an option. That was one of the central conclusions of the agricultural champions. That premise also features strongly in the discussion paper published by the National Council of Rural Advisors last week who said, now is the time to change the way we think, act and operate to tailor bespoke policy frameworks. NFU Scotland have also titled their discussion document for a new agricultural policy for Scotland post-Brexit simply as change. So, presenting officer, change now seems inevitable. What we must therefore determine is how far we go and importantly, how fast. Yet we are having to navigate our future through a bewildering set of uncertainties. We don't yet know when we might be made to leave the EU. It may be 29th March next year. It might be the end of 2020 or at some date as yet unknown. There is little clarity about funding. We have a commitment from the UK government to provide the same cash total in funds for farm support until the end of the current UK parliament and for contracts entered into before the end of March next year to be honored. We are leaving the EU, it is said, on the 29th of March 2019, but have no idea what will follow. That is not all. Additional information around funding guarantees have been sought by me and Cabinet colleagues time and again, but has not been forthcoming. And perhaps worst of all is the prospect of being denied control over or access to those powers hard won in the devolution settlement, powers which matter hugely for rural Scotland in terms of enabling Scotland to design its own solutions on funding and policy to meet Scottish needs on farming, food production, food standards and the environment. But the clock is ticking and we can no longer wait for Westminster and must get on with determining our own future. And while the well-being of Scotland might mean nothing to Westminster, it is our central and overriding concern. Rural Scotland deserves security and stability in the short term. So today, presiding officer, I'm launching a consultation and proposals to provide stability and security for rural businesses in the immediate post-Brexit period. It marks the start of the process of developing a new rural support policy for Scotland. It also, it also forms part of a civic conversation being led by the National Council of Rural Advisors over the summer to shape a comprehensive new approach to supporting Scotland's rural economy. This consultation focuses on what might be done to provide stability in the period immediately after Scotland might have to leave the EU in 2019. It sets out ideas for short-term simplifications that could help current claimants of cap-related support whilst also improving or enhancing the delivery of policy goals. It also asks questions on how best to support and integrate agriculture into the broader rural economy over the transition period and beyond. And finally, it seeks views on how pilot projects might be developed and used to test different approaches to rural support which might be taken forward into the future. It's not an entirely open-ended consultation. I'm clear about what I think the key proposals should be and that these proposals should aim to deliver stability and security for businesses and communities. Firstly, this plan proposes that we have a transition period. The Agriculture Champions recommendation and rationale for a three to five year period is compelling. 
such a transition period would provide the space we need to properly develop and devise a new and different approach for Scotland. This, presiding officer, is in stark contrast to the one-year transition period currently proposed by the UK. Within this five-year window, I'm proposing we have a two-year period of stability where we continue to adhere to EU rules. During this initial phase, I would envisage that current EU support schemes would remain largely the same, providing security where it is needed most. That security will be enhanced for over 11,000 farmers and crofters by my decision also to maintain LFAS in 219 at 80%, ensuring that our most marginalized farmers and crofters continue to receive the support they need. In the second phase of the transition period, I'm proposing to make some amendments to payment schemes to simplify and improve customer service uh, or provide enhanced public benefit. And also to make clear we are not standing still during this crucial period. I want to explore and consider income parameters for farm payments, but I also want to declutter the payment landscape by removing penalties for minor discretions. Such an approach signals a key shift in mindset and attitude away from strict compliance towards a relationship based on trust that values and supports delivery based on outcomes. I also want to reduce the administrative burden on a range of steps in the payment systems and process, including around inspections, mapping, and scheme rules. And further, I'm proposing that we use this time to streamline, streamline and synergize some of the myriad Pillar 2 schemes. These measures will free up resources in their widest sense to be used to invest more in activity that we do now that we will want to continue in the future. For example, we already know we want to support more new and young entrants into farming and food production. So we will want to continue providing support in that area. But we will also utilize resources to innovate and develop pilot new approaches. As well as encouraging new and, entrants, new and young entrants, we know we have intergenerational challenges that we will need to address. As part of this consultation, I also want to hear views on the longer direction of travel. All ideas and proposals will be explored as part of the wider civic conversation around how best to sustain a vibrant and flourishing rural economy into the future. Key to this will be exploring how best to combine delivery of desirable outcomes for rural Scotland with support in the future. A new rural policy framework should seek to ensure that public investments in social, economic and environmental capital not only create a stable and secure environment for rural businesses, but contribute to a sustainable, productive, diverse and thriving rural economy. In conclusion, presiding officer, there's no doubt that the next few years are going to be extremely challenging for rural Scotland. But unlike the UK government, which becomes more chaotic and clueless by the day, this government is focused on its responsibilities to protect and serve the best interests of the people and businesses in our rural communities. Since the EU referendum almost two years ago, the UK government has provided little clarity and almost no certainty. With less than a year to go to a Brexit that Scotland neither voted for nor wants, we cannot wait any longer. Rural Scotland needs and deserves as much security and stability as can be provided in the short term and today, I have published a plan to help achieve that. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement, and I intend to allow around 20 minutes for that. Then we'll move on to the next item of business. May I ask members who wish to ask a question to press the request to speak buttons, and I call Donald Cameron. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement, and I refer to crofting and farming in my register of interest. It is with a sense of irony that I heard in the statement that the Scottish Government feels it can no longer wait and must get on with determining our own future, given that every opposition party in this chamber has been urging the Government to stop dithering and get on with outlining its plans since the Brexit vote almost two years ago. This is the third ministerial statement in as many weeks, and until now, it is the Scottish Government who has provided little clarity and almost no certainty. And it's only after pressure from these benches 
a day before the Royal Highland Show, that the Cabinet Secretary is finally forced to make a statement to Parliament. That said, we welcome this consultation in terms of transition. We will take time to digest the proposals. Where there is common ground, we will seek to find it. Our priorities for support are that the UK internal market is protected, that support concentrates on production from active farming, protects our environment, and recognises that 85% of farmland in Scotland is in less favoured areas. So my questions to the Sec Cabinet Secretary are these. In the light of the documentation of the last three we weeks, will he commit to holding a proper debate on this subject in this chamber as soon as possible after recess? And secondly, given the NFUS concerns expressed yesterday about the EU Commission's approach to LFAS, does he recognise that a cap to LFAS at 80% in 2019 and potentially 20% in 2020 will be a significant blow to many of Scotland's livestock farmers? Uh, in response to the questions Mr Cameron asked, yes, I'm happy to debate uh, these matters. I think it's right to have a debate. There's a question about the timing. Uh, I think it would benefit us to have the responses to the consultation document. The document here will be consulted upon, uh, but I do obviously, subject to parliamentary uh, authorities, a, a propose that a debate is had. It's a positive suggestion, and I entirely agree that that is something that we would do anyway. Uh, I'm very sorry to disabuse Mr Cameron of his notion of the efficacy of the Scottish Conservatives, but we have, in fact, been working on this for several months, as I uh, hinted at when I gave evidence to the Rural Committee, and as I think any members would actually expect. Um, as far as Elfast is concerned, uh, the European Parliament happily postponed the operation of the 80% limit, uh, and therefore uh, we maintained Elfast at 100% this year in Scotland, uh, uh, it will go down to 80%, but it is completely unacceptable that it goes down to 20% the year after. This paper sets out uh, uh, proposals and asks questions about how we avoid that coming to pass. It is essential that we support our hill farmers. I'm pleased that Mr Cameron has raised this letter. I intend to press the point with Mr Gove when I see him at the Royal Highland Show uh, tomorrow. Uh, and I'm pleased that the Conservatives have uh, recognised that this is a serious document uh, and it's one which I think will be broadly welcomed by many farmers precisely because it offers stability of continued income, but it is, of course, dependent upon the UK government playing its part uh, and delivering on their promises uh, that uh, post-Brexit uh, they will deliver and at least match the EU funding that we came to acknowledge uh, as necessary. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement. Today's statement is long overdue, but it is also welcome. I agree with the Cabinet Secretary that in the current constitutional chaos, there does remain a lack of clarity from the UK Government in areas such as policy funding, devolution, access to EU labour and trading conditions. But the reality is, for months, organisations such as the NFU and Scottish Environment Link and governments such as the Welsh Government have been leading the way, setting out what these say see as the key principles for rural and agricultural support post-Brexit, but the Scottish Government has been left standing. And there's much within today's statement um, that I do very much uh, welcome and agree with, such as a, a stability period of, of two years and also a commitment to declutter the payment landscape. But as the Cabinet Secretary said, the clock is ticking. So will he give a clear commitment that the consultation will be carried out on a timely basis and that firm detailed proposals will be set out as soon as possible because rural businesses and communities need to start to plan now and the lack of clarity is already damaging our rural economy? Fergus Well, I think I'll interpret that as broadly a welcome, um, uh, being an optimist. Um, what, what I would say to be serious is that this plan uh, sets out a very clear set of proposals it sets out that farmers for the next two years in a stability period would, broadly speaking, continue the payments that they have received under Pillar 1, the basic payment and the other payments. It then suggests there should be a further three years where we would proceed along those lines, but then seek to introduce improvements and changes. Uh, I think that mix of stability, certainty and simplicity will be broadly welcomed by farmers in Scotland. And I'm bound to say, having read the other documents uh, by UK government and other bodies throughout the UK, this is, so far as I'm aware, the most detailed plan that exists on Brexit. 
This is more detailed than any other document that has been produced on Brexit, and that is because we have spent several works, several months, uh, working on the need to remove the uncertainty of the current time with certainty over a period not of one year, as Mr. Gove proposes, but five years. Uh, and if I'm right, presiding officer, farmers will think that a five-year transition will give us the necessary time to prepare for the change that I think most commentators regard as necessary. I do have a lot of questions, so if we can get straight to the questions, please, and short answers where possible. And I call Kate Forbes to be followed by Edward Mountain. Can I welcome, uh, as I know my constituents will, the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to over 11,000 farmers and crofters with his decision to maintain Elfas at 80% next year. But does he agree that any move to pay Elfas at 20% for 2020 would be severely detrimental to crofters and farmers, many of whom have made that clear to me? And will he commit to exploring options to ensure that our most marginalised farmers and crofters, many of whom are in my constituency, continue to receive the support that they need? Uh, yes, uh, Kate Forbes represents uh, uh, much of Inverness and Rosshire. Uh, and there are many, many hill farmers uh, there uh, in my constituency uh, and uh, indeed throughout the 85% of Scotland is covered by Elfas uh, that rely on these payments. It is, as I said, completely unacceptable that Elfas goes to 20%. I'd also remind members that Scotland is the only part of the UK that has continued with the less favoured area scheme. In fact, I believe that's been the case for around about uh, seven years. Uh, to quote from the paper at page 13, uh, the consultation paper, presiding officer, the Scottish Government's main priority is, is to explore options for protect it, protecting affected farmers and crofters in this period and maintaining levels of income support as far as possible, taking into account legislative state aid and budgetary factors. So we are wholly committed to doing precisely what Kate Forbes has asked for for her constituents. Edward Mountain, followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'd like to uh, refer members to my declaration of interest. I'm delighted that Cabinet Secretary has come forward in answer to our calls with some ideas and the calls of industry. It's sad it's taken so long. But I do welcome that he has accepted the need for a two-year stability period. But as he says, the clock is ticking. In most cases, farming business already working to a five- to ten-year plan. Will this government publish their vision for agriculture post the two-year stability period before the end of this year? Fergus uh, Ewing. Well, this, this document sets out very clearly our vision for agriculture, and I've done so on many previous occasions. I, I'm pleased that there is a broad welcome for this plan. It, it's a transition period lasting five years, the first two of which broadly would be affected by EU rules, and the further three would be an opportunity to provide something, presiding officer, that every single farmer I've ever spoken to wishes, a simpler system. This paper sets out a number of ways in relation to mapping, uh, in relation to inspections, in relation to administration, how that simpler system could be achieved. I have to say that, to be fair to him, Commissioner Hogan, has also expressed similar desires and objectives in the, the current uh, CAP proposals that were considered by the Council of Ministers uh, in Luxembourg, and I was in attendance for part of that meeting. Uh, so uh, we have published the most detailed plan in the UK, so far as I'm aware, uh, and I hope and expect that over the Royal Highland Show, which many of us will be attending, that I can engage with many farmers in particular uh, and discuss with them these proposals uh, and get their views on our consultation document over the summer months. John Mason, followed by Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned a number of bodies, including the Agricultural Champions, the National Council of Rural Advisors, NFU Scotland, and I think others would include the CAP Greening Group, that have done quite a lot of work in this area already and made comments. Does he feel that uh, a further consultation is really necessary and there's more to be gained from that? Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, I think it's necessary because looking at this uh, analytically, there are really uh, two periods. There's a period where we prepare for change and then there's the period of major change after that. Uh, in my view, it's essential that the first period is long enough to have the national debate that I think all members recognise is necessary. 
uh, to formulate the policy and then ensure that we're capable of delivering it and administering it perfectly. Uh, that takes time. Uh, I think it's somewhat comical that the UK government think that that could be achieved in one year. It can't. I suspect the UK will renege on that at some distant time. But uh, I do not think that there is any uh, overlap or duplication between the various reports that have been issued. They're all intended to do different things. And I'm proud that the Scottish Government has already reached out through the National Council of Rural Advisors, through our four agricultural champions, to set out clearly a vision of what the longer term change will be uh, uh, after the end of the transition period. Claudia Beamish, followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I welcome the long overdue consultation. In the simplification and piloting new approaches section, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what is there to inspire the necessary shift to a fusion of production and environmental ways of working towards agroecology and the support that farmers will need for this? Fergus Ewing. Well, I think many farmers are already grasping that challenge uh, uh, and doing so uh, uh, with vigour and success. Uh, and yes, we do want to continue the work to focus on the environment. For example, carbon testing, the improval of soil quality, uh, concentrating on effective drainage techniques, which of course are centuries old and fundamental uh, to farming. This paper does set out certain matters in relation to the environmental schemes and pillar two, uh, although more work is needed to be done on that because of course they're not, uh, largely speaking, recurrent payments. Uh, their individual projects in many cases. Uh, but I look forward to working with Claudia Beamish uh, on developing um, a simpler system uh, and one which meets the needs both of farmers and also the environment. Emma Harper followed by Mark Rusko. Thank you, President Officer. In my chamber, I am a PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. The Cabinet Secretary has mentioned that uh, he and colleagues have pressed for certainty on funding, for example. Can he provide the Chamber with examples of what we don't have certainty on? Fergus Ewing. Uh, well, the, the, I think there's broadly three or four areas. One is that we really don't know what the position is in relation to Pillar 2 projects signed after 2019. And that's less than a year away. Most of these projects are very long term. Secondly, we have no idea um, after we fully leave the EU what the funding position is. Thirdly, we don't know if the UK are going to deliver and implement the promise they made that funding, the funding that we received from Europe would be at least matched. And lastly, and I'll be pressing this with Mr. Gove when I meet him uh, at the Royal Highland Show, uh, we have still no action on implementing the convergence funding pledge the pledge that uh, Mr. Gove made to proceed with an independent review. I can only assume that when he comes to Scotland tomorrow, he will announce that the delay is over, the dithering is at an end, and the review will, as he promised uh, last November, finally, after years of delay, go ahead. Mark Ruskell, followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you. Um, we will incentivise methods of farming that create new habitats for wildlife, increase biodiversity, reduce flood risk, mitigate climate change, and improve air quality. Sadly, this isn't the Scottish Government's vision, but the vision of DEFRA out for consultation since February. We still await the Scottish Government's vision for what it's actually trying to achieve with its food and agriculture policies. Now, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how will these status quo measures that have been announced today get Scotland's biodiversity targets back on track? We are failing with our biodiversity targets. We have the news that one out of five of every single uh, British Mr. Ruskell, you've asked your extinction. question. What is the Cabinet mm. Secretary going to do around this? Fergus Ewing. Well, I would refer the member to question 25, page 22, regarding agri-environment climate scheme matters, uh, and also climate change matters on page 18 of the document. It doesn't seem that he's read them. Mike Rumbles, to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Presenting officer, the Cabinet Secretary just said in a statement, this marks the start the start of the process of developing a new rural support policy for Scotland, and I said, hooray. But 18 months ago, this parliament unanimously on the Liberal Democrat amendment told him to start this process. We have lost a year and a half. Why has it taken him so long? Bergshing. Well, I, I was pleased to hear the hurrah, but I did expect that it would be caveated, and I wasn't surprised. Uh, uh, we've been working for some time on these uh, 
proposals, we had hoped that by now we would have had greater clarity on the big Brexit questions. Uh, questions about are there going to be tariffs of as much as 70% in some of our food produce? Questions about will people that work from EU countries be able to continue to do that? Uh, questions such as are we going to be flooded by cheap meat imports from countries that do not respect our high environment and welfare standards? No answers worth forthcoming. We've been preparing this for several months when we decided, as I said in the statement, that the time for waiting for Westminster to act was over. Now this most detailed plan, I believe, in the UK will, I hope, alleviate the concerns of farmers. And it's over to the UK government now uh, to confirm that they will provide the necessary funding to enable this stability, certainty and simplicity to be guaranteed over five years ahead. If we can be quick, I'll manage John McAlpin, followed by John Scott. Thank you. Scottish farmers have been members of the single market for all the 25 years that it's existed. And without membership of the single market and the customs union, as the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, they'll face tariffs and labour shortages. Do the Cabinet Secretary share my concern that no amount of subsidy can mitigate the damage that will be done to farmers and rural communities by a Tory hard Brexit? Ferguson. Well, I think it's a very serious point, and I entirely agree. And I noticed just this morning that the director of the Fraser of Allender Institute said this about the UK government. They said, with just nine months to go until the UK leaves the EU, the lack of a coherent plan from within Whitehall about the UK's long-term economic relationship with our most important trading partner risks holding back Scotland's recovery. At least today, the Scottish government has published a plan that would address some of those problems, but it cannot address the bigger problems that uh, Joan McAlpin mentions about freedom of movement of people, uh, the application of tariffs, and the withdrawal of access to the single market that has been so important to our farmers in Scotland. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I declare an interest as a hill farmer? Presiding Officer, another day, another consultation, but in the real world, concerns are growing, and the Cabinet Secretary is well aware of the concerns of the sheep industry and QMS's concerns about the future viability of sheep farming in Scotland's LFAs post-Brexit, given the massive cuts to LFA LFAS he is proposing. Given the lack of alternatives to sheep farming in much of Scotland's LFAs, what additional special measures does the Scottish Government consider are likely to be required to keep farmers and, as food producers and custodians of our landscape in business in Scotland's LFAs post-Brexit as LFAS payments reduced from 65 million to 13 million in 2020. Fergus well, well, as I said, uh, Signing Officer, uh, this year uh, I made sure that LFAS was paid at 100% after the European Parliament secured that concession from the previous proposals, which were that it must be at 80%. So we took action to deal with that. Uh, secondly, we've announced uh, that we will continue to pay LFAS at the maximum possible rate that we can pay it. And thirdly, I've said, and it's in the paper, page 13, I did refer to it in, in uh, responding to Kate Forbes, 20%, going down to 20%, I think that's what Mr. Scott's question envisages in the figures that he quoted, is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. And we therefore want views from all, all concerned about uh, other alternative means of providing the necessary support and I'm pleased that there seems to be a consensus across this chamber that that is the correct approach. If it's a very quick question I can squeeze in Angus Macdonald, very quick. Okay thanks, um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if the UK Government has bothered to share its draft agriculture, agriculture bill and will it contain measures that impact on farming and food production in Scotland? Very quick answer please Mr Ewing. Uh, no it has not. Thank you. That concludes questions on the Cabinet Secretary's statement and we'll move on to the next item of business. A uh, couple of moments for people to shift seats. <laughs>